Morgan Housel, uh, thank you so much for joining us and uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here, Julia. Well, um, you know that I've been a fan of your writing for a long time and that I absolutely love your book, The Psychology of Money. I literally have the audiobook version, the Kindle version, and the physical copy. So um, one of... Uh, They're all the same, you know. You're not going to get know, anything different. Like, I just like different ways of consuming it. And it's something that I've been telling so many folks to get. Um, so I guess to kind of kick things off here... Um, the book has obviously been a huge success, more than a million copies sold worldwide, international bestseller, and it was one that really took me by surprise as the readers, just to how much I'd love it and how much I'd recommend it. So my question for you, Morgan, is did you envision it being this successful, and why, why do you think it resonated with so many folks out there? Well, the first, the first answer to that is a really easy no, and I'll tell you the background about it. I've talked a little bit about this before, but um, when we first pitched the idea to all the big New York publishers, every single one of them turned it down. Every New York publisher said, no way are we gonna publish this. Half of them wouldn't even return our emails. And the ones that did write back said, no way this is gonna sell. Other people have tried this before. There's really no market for this. And they wouldn't even take it. And then so I was kind of out of my own. I thought about self-publishing it because we literally could not find a single publisher in America who would even touch it. And then found a, a, a group in London, Harriman House, who turned out to be amazing people that I really like working with now, who agreed to take it um, and, and kind of believed in the idea and ran with it there. But just from that early experience, I think at the time I could toggle between, oh, those publishers don't know what they're talking about. This is still going to be great. And like, no, they totally know what they're talking about. These are the professional people who understand the book industry better than ever, than, than anyone. And everyone, every single one of them is independently telling me this is a terrible idea. So from the, from the beginning, I, 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 really, I really didn't have that much confidence in it. And also in the book industry, if you know the data behind it, you know, it's very much like a seed stage startup where it's like 90% chance you're going to fail. Even if you do everything right, you're, it's probably not going to work. So just going into that, knowing the base rate of how books work and knowing everyone else's opinion of this idea, it was like, no, I, I really didn't think that much of it. I think my expectations were, were pretty low going into it. And then, so when it kind of caught on early on, it was, it was still a shock and still is, you know, a year and a half later, it's still kind of, you know, I think you and I had talked about this at yeah. dinner several months ago about like, I think when you start off from those low expectations, it tends, they tend to stick around. It's hard to switch your view to like, oh no, that was then, but things are different now. Now it is working. It's easy to anchor on like, no, it's supposed to suck. And eventually people are going to realize that it sucks. <laughs> it's, it's easy to hold on to that, that point of view. Yeah. It's interesting too. When you say it's like seed stage startup, it kind of reminds me just a, a little bit like investing in general, like basically the winners or the people who do really well, it's like, they've only really had a few winners or you don't have to be right all the time. So obviously a great um, call on Harriman House's part. I guess the second part of the question though, is like, why is it like, why do you think it resonated with people so much? I can tell I, you my I, reason. I always think, I still think that 90% of virality is luck. You see this on Twitter all the time, where sometimes there are tweets that are like, let's face it, they're okay. They're kind of funny. They get 100,000 likes, 100,000 retweets. Some of them are good. Some of them are just like, how did this catch on? And I think a lot of virality is just the right person at the right time retweeted it, sent it going. It got people's attention, took on a life of its own. And then there's also a lot of tweets that I see people do that are hilarious and so insightful and so good that go nowhere. It's true for books, it's true for businesses as well of like, you really need a lot of things outside of your control to go right in order to really get critical mass on something. And I think that's, that's true for this as well. I think if there is one thing about the book that in my view kind of distinguishes it a little bit, it's that when I set out to write it, I said, okay, a normal book chapter is 5,000 words. That's kind of what a normal book chapter is. Uh, 10 chapters of 5,000 word uh, 5, words, that's what a book is. And I started writing that way. And I had a year to write the book. And after 10 months, literally after, after 10 months in, into my one year process, I had two shitty chapters that did not make it into the book. And the reason was like, I was trying to reinvent my whole writing style and being like, okay, I normally write blogs, but now I need to write a book with a capital B and that's totally different. And I was just flailing. I didn't really have, it's, I was adding in tons of fluff that didn't make any sense and trying to just in the name of length, I was trying to go on to these crazy tangents. And so after 10 months, I totally threw that out and said, look, I know how to write blog posts. That's what I've done my whole career. So I'm going to deliver a book of blog posts. And I was kind of ashamed about that at the time. 
And I thought people are really going to call this out and say, it's not really an actual book. In fact, I'll tell you a story. I had uh, breakfast with a fairly well-known author um, before the book came out, as I was writing the book. And I told him basically what I just told you. I said, you know, it used to be 5,000 word chapters, but I'm going to switch it to just 2,000 word chapters. And he politely, he didn't mean to offend me, but he said, oh, so it's not really a book. It's a collection of essays, but it's not a book. And I kind of went, oh, oh, this is so painful. But I just, I just went with it because that's what I knew how to do. So I said, okay, these are going to be very short chapters. Some of the chapters are, they're, they're blog post length. Yeah. And I think when I was ashamed of that, I think that ended up, there was a large number of readers who really appreciated that. I'm who said, look, in, in, most, in most books, you don't need 5,000 words to explain a single point. So in my book, I said, okay, there's a one chapter in there that's one page. The whole chapter is one page. Yeah. And when I was writing it, it was like, I have this one point that I think is, is inside that I think is kind of neat and I can explain it to you in three paragraphs and I don't have anything else to say about it. Maybe other people do, but I don't. So I'm just going to write my three paragraphs and move on to the next chapter. And I think that's what distinguishes it. It's just like really short um, brevity. It, it doesn't feel like a book. It feels like a collection of blog posts. Cause that's what it is. Yeah. There's something about the concision and also just made me like keep turning the page. Like it was just like such a great way to consume it. And I think that's one of the things I appreciate about your writing is like every single word has its place. Like there's no additional fluff. Um, one of the other things I just appreciate about you and your work is you kind of like bring up these ideas and they're like hidden in plain sight is how I would kind of describe it. That's how my husband would probably describe it too. He's a fan of your work. And it's just like, once you like put it out there, it's like, aha, like, why didn't I think of that? But that's kind of like how it's always been. And, um, I guess I'll like use one of the examples or have you explain it for the folks listening or, and watching is the rich man in the car paradox. And we should probably maybe before we get into that, even talk about your, I guess like one of your earlier jobs as a valet, like, can you explain um, this kind of paradox and, and your own experience uh, of parking high end cars? Yeah. So one of my, my first jobs, I started when I was uh, 18, I guess. And I did it all throughout college. I was a valet at uh, two really fancy high-end five-star hotels. And so as the valet was parking, people come in in their Aston Martins and their Bentleys and their Rolls Royces and their Ferraris. And so that was, A, that was my first experience with like big time wealth of being like being exposed to a, a level of wealth that I did not know existed in the world. So that was interesting in itself. But I had this kind of realization after years that when somebody would drive in, in their Lamborghini, I would not look at the driver and say, whoa, that guy's cool, that guy's rich. Look at him, he must be cool. I would imagine myself as the driver and I would assume that if I was the driver, people would think I was cool and people would think I was successful and people would admire me. And so the irony was like, I did not care at all about the guy driving the car, but I thought that if I was the driver, people would care about me. And I think that's a big disconnect that people have with wealth is that it's so easy to over assume that people are thinking about you. And the truth is nobody is thinking about you as much as you are. Nobody in the world thinks about you as much as you do. It's true for everyone, even with the lowest ego, but people really get this wrong when they have nice stuff, a nice house, nice clothes, nice car, nice jewelry, whatever it is. By and large, you do that for social reasons. Yeah. And there's some of that that makes sense. And I do it. You do like, I'm not saying, you know, live in a burlap sack, but but the, most of the reason you do that is for social reasons and people massively overestimate how much social benefit they're going to get because when they see you in your beautiful house, in your nice car, wearing your amazing clothes, by and large, they don't think that person is great. They think if I looked like that, people would think I would be great because what everyone's just trying to get after is climbing the social ladder. So rather than saying that person climbed the ladder, they say, if I did it, I would climb the ladder. So that was just the insight that I had um, over time. And when I had that that realization, I looked at these people driving the Lamborghinis totally differently. And I looked at him with almost a sense of sadness of like, you think everyone's looking at you, but we're not, I'm not looking at you. I'm looking at your car and I want your car, but I don't, I could care less about you. And so once I had that realization, then I was like, well, okay. So now I understand the game. I see the game that people are getting and it's a stupid game that nobody can win. So then that totally changed my aspirations for really flashy material things. Cause back then I wanted to be the guy in the Ferrari. I wanted to be the guy in the Lamborghini. And after that realization, I was like, no, because it's just a dumb game that nobody can win. Yeah. Now I still like, I still like nice cars. I still really, whenever I see them, I'm like, oh, it's beautiful. It's so cool looking, but I don't aspire to have myself because I know that the social status you get from it is so much different than you expect. 
yeah, it's such a like profound insight too. Like once once you like explain that in the chapter, it changed like how I even look at cars. Like I think I probably think of it all the time now. But um, I do want to just like kind of tease out a few things because there's a lot to unpack here. Um, you mentioned like it like how you kind of live your own life and um like flashy cars and stuff like like what do you like what do you drive like how do you kind of like structure your own life we have we have a toyota suv uh it's a hybrid we got it i don't know nine months ago it's a great car we have no i should say we have two young kids so no matter what we get the back seat's going to be covered with cheetos and jelly beans and (laughs) spilled orange juice so if we got a fancy car it's it's going to be trash no matter what we get so we should get something that we don't mind getting dirty because we got these young kids um but we, we live in a, a, a for, I mean, everything is so relative. So in my mind, I think we live in a great house and drive a great car and wear great clothes, but other people might disagree. Other people might think that it's super nice. Other people might think it's, it's a joke. There's no, there's no objective nice. Everything is just comparing yourself to somebody else. And there are such a huge strata of wealth in the world that no matter what you're driving, no matter where you're living, no matter what clothes you're wearing, somebody's doing it better than you. Somebody has a bigger house than you. Somebody has a better car than you. And so there are for sure people that have a fleet of Ferraris and are embarrassed because this guy's got the rare Ferrari. And so that's when it's like, in my mind, in my wife's mind, we live a great material life. And I think our house is amazing. I think our cars are great, but other people might disagree with that. Because I think that again is like, once you realize the game, then you just have to turn to like the internal benchmarks and be like, okay, this makes me happy. Yeah. And this, this car makes us happy. It fits for our life. I'm proud to have it. If, if I have you over for dinner, and I hope I do someday with your with your husband, as we had, we had dinner in Miami not too long ago, yeah. I would be proud to have you into our house because I think it's a nice house. So that's then like once you realize there's no objectivity, it's just like you just got to get to a level where you're like this is this is good enough and this is nice and makes me happy, and then just leave it there. Exactly. Like you make a point to again. It's like everything is just like has its place and it's so profound, but it's something simple. It's like wealth is like what you don't see, and like just like to the car point, like. I know, I know a billionaire, like a multi-billionaire who just, he rides, he drives a, a Volvo SUV, which is like a, it's a solid, nice, amazing car. But you think like, wow, you could have any car you want, but it's just like a quality car, I guess, you know? So it's, um, it's, it's interesting. Um, cause there it's was like- this quote to, I liked from many years ago, it was maybe like 20 years ago and Bill Gates, um, his house is, I think it's 75,000 square feet, something like that. It's just like, it's a commercial building basically. Fantastic. And someone yeah. was asking about like how amazing that must be. And he said, I'm paraphrasing, I forget the exact number of He's like, look, my house has 30 bedrooms, but I can only sleep in one of them at a time. So it doesn't feel that much different from your house that has two bedrooms. And I thought that was a really, a really good point of this. Like for a lot of these things, the, the benefit that you get from them is so much less than, than you would think. Yeah. And you know, when you stay at a Hyatt, you're staying in a 200 bedroom house, but you don't care because you only, you only have one room that you're staying in that you can actually benefit from. So I think it's, it's similar when you're comparing like a mega mansion to your house. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, Warren Buffett, it sounds like at a certain point, like there's only like, you know, money kind of runs out of its utility. There's only so much utility you get from money at like a certain point. Um, there's also, I think there's also this really interesting point. I just read the biography of Will Smith, which was really, Ooh, really I good. Yeah. For some, I, 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 didn't, I didn't think I would enjoy it, but it was so well written that I, I really did. And he made this point that when he was depressed and broke, he could say to himself, if only I had more money, all my problems would go away. But then when he was depressed and rich, he couldn't say that anymore. And he lost his sense of hope. So when he was broke, he had hope that if he just had more money, this would, this would go away. But when he was rich, he was like, I'm depressed and there's no hope. No, like no more money is going to make me happier. I thought that was a really interesting thing of, of just another anecdote of how we um, misassume what money can and can't do for us. Yeah. Um, there's so many anecdotes in the book. And before I move on from like your valet days, um, you like tell this crazy story about someone like driving. I don't even know like how much their car was, but they came in like bought, they gave like, they were like throwing around stacks of cash. Right. And you got to tell the story because it was wild. Like, and then buying the coins <laughs> Please like tell that story. Yes, I, I won't. I won't share his name because I, I don't speak kindly of him in the book. But it was a very successful entrepreneur who had started and sold several companies. Crazy successful, like tech genius, visionary. You, I, I can't say enough adjectives to describe like how smart and successful this guy. And he had the most, the craziest relationship with money that I've ever seen. So I read in the books. One of the one of the oddest stories was. He used to ask us, the valet, all the time to run little errands for him. 
he would carry around it every day, all the time. He had a stack of cash, $100 bills, probably that thick, which is $50,000, something like that, that he would have in his pocket all the time. And he would not count it. He would just peel off little stacks and, and give it to you for running these errands. So one of the days he comes up to one of my colleagues, not, not me, but another valet. He peels off a, a stack of $100 bills and he said, go down to the jewelry store down the street and buy us a bunch of gold coins. I think they were like $1,000 gold coins. And he comes back and this entrepreneur and his friends, there's maybe like four of them, something like that. Um, they go down to the ocean. The hotel I was at was, was on the water and they start skipping these gold coins like they're rocks and they're seeing who can skip them far enough. Like, like who, who, who can skip it the farthest? And they're like cackling like they're kids. They're drunk out of their mind and they're throwing probably tens of thousands of dollars into the Pacific Ocean. They're, as far as I know, they're still there. If people want to go look for it. But I remember watching that and being like, how is this going to end? How is this guy's, like, how, how long can this maintain? Yeah, like, what was going through your mind? Because you were a young man at the time. Like, what, what were you, like, thinking? Like, is this normal? Is this, like, how rich people behave? Like, it's so, in, like, what was going the on in your is, mind? That is, that is one of 50 stories that I could tell about this guy. That's one of the most shocking. But there were so many stories of, of that like us. The other story that I think I use in the book, he, he was drunk all the time. And one day he comes out of the hotel restaurant stumbling and the, and the restaurant manager comes chasing after him. And he says, sir, you just broke a $5,000 lamp or $500 lamp. You just, you just smashed this lamp. It's $500. And the guy, the entrepreneur takes out his giant wad of cash and he goes, $500. He goes, here's $5,000. Now get the fuck out of my face and don't ever talk to me like that again. And I remember being like, oh, this is, but th that, that was like a daily occurrence of this guy. It was just, it was like a, it was like a reality TV show to watch. So he, he had a big impact on how I can see people who are very smart, just objectively geniuses and still have a terrible relationship with money. And the punchline is I learned years later, after I left the hotel, I learned that he went bankrupt. And like, when I heard that, I'm like, yeah, of course he did. Of course he went bankrupt. That was the most obvious ending to the story that you can ever imagine. But that was so amazing because he was so smart and he had the, and he was so unsuccessful with money. It became so, he had so much income and he lost everything. And you compare that to people who are not geniuses, who are just ordinary Joe Blows from the street that end up becoming so successful with money and can fund the most lavish retirement that they want and fulfill all their dreams. And when they die, they leave millions of dollars to charity. You compare that to the genius. And I think that's like an astounding thing. And there's no other area of life where I think that happens. Except for finance. Like there aren't many areas of life where other than finance, where, where the smartest people can do so poorly and the most humble average people can, can do so well. It doesn't really happen anywhere else. I think the one area it kind of happens to sometime is health and medicine, where you can be a Harvard trained doctor, but if you smoke and drink and you don't sleep and whatnot, you, you, like, you'll have terrible health. And on the other hand, you can be a completely average person who eats their vegetables and goes for a run every day and you'll be really healthy. But most areas in life, there's such a strong correlation between what you know and how well you do. And in finance, I just think it's, it's, it's not that at all, that there's almost no correlation between how smart you are and how well you do in the end. Yeah, I want to dive into that because you do give some great examples. But just really quick before we go there, um, I have another valet question. Um, you mentioned this guy. He's got some crazy stories. Like, I don't know. Do you have any other good ones, like famous people you parked for that you're allowed to share? Or like, what's the craziest ride that you had to park? Like, just kind of curious because I've never been one, but I'm sure you've seen I some think, things. Well, one, that, one that stuck out was um, one time I was, I was kind of standing there with my head down. I wasn't really paying attention. And somebody walked up to me and said, excuse me, where's the bathroom? And instantly I recognized it. This was George Costanza. It was Jason Alexander, the actor. But the crazy thing, I think most people who've met a celebrity can relate to this. In that moment, I was not talking to Jason Alexander. I was talking to George Costanza. And I wanted to be like, where's Jerry? Where's Kramer? It's like those people who are so um, attached to their identity from one character, it's hard to detach them from that. And I think that's I think in, in to their life, that's probably a, a bad thing that he's not Jason, he's George. That's yeah. probably, he probably doesn't appreciate that. But for so many people, that was, yeah. that was, that was that experience. Probably like certain voices you hear and just like associate with that character. Um, okay. Yep. So going back, so there's this great like kind of juxtaposition from these people who are irresponsible with money. Um, you mentioned the guy that was throwing the gold coins. There was this investment banker who was just way over levered during the financial crisis, like crazy real estate, went bankrupt. And then you compare that with like the janitor. You have this amazing chapter about this man, Ronald Reed, who 
died in his 90s with like what like eight million dollars yeah. um like let's kind of pick that apart like how that's like even possible because you might think on the surface like how's that possible like i think people were shocked by this um his family was shocked yeah ron reed is like the most humble guy you can ever imagine he was a gas station attendant and a janitor that's what he did for his career after he died when he kind of became famous journalists went out and asked his friends like what were ronald's hobbies and the only hobby they could come up with from his friends was like, oh, he liked cutting firewood. That was his hobby. That's what he did for enjoyment. Just like the most like salt of the earth, humble person. And when he died, he left $8 million to charity. And there was no inheritance. He didn't win the lottery. It was just, he took what tiny money he could save from his job as a janitor mopping floors. And he invested in the stock market and he left it alone for decades. And that's it. It's the whole, there's nothing more to the story than that. So that gets to my point of like, these people who have no education, no experience, no Bad, no connections, no capital. And they do so much better, perform so much better than some of the people who have the best education and the best background, the best training. And those are extreme, like cherry picked anecdotes. But there's also a lot of this for average people where most Americans invest in the stock market by dollar cost averaging to their 401k. Every paycheck, $100 is withdrawn and put into their 401k and they don't even know their password. They're not trading. They never touch it. They don't even know like where it's going, what it's doing. And for the most part, for the people who do that over decades, which is a lot of people, the results can be incredible. And these are people who don't even know what they're doing. They don't even know, they have no clue like what they're contributing to, but that's the point. It's completely hands off. They just leave it alone. And you compare those people who don't know what they're doing to the performance of a lot of hedge funds and the people who forgot their password are doing so much better than the average, not just some hedge funds, but the average hedge fund. So even among ordinary people, like not individual cherry picked examples, like broad data looking at this, a lot of indiv individual investors who don't know what they're doing still perform better than a lot of professionals who are devoting their lives and their intelligence to trying to do this better. Yeah. It's it, that, that to me is like one of those interesting things, because sometimes I just feel like, you know, being in this industry, like we emulate a lot of these super uber successful hedge fund managers, money managers, investors, and, and whatnot, whereas maybe the formula is much more simple uh, than we make it out to be. But then on the other side of that is like, you also realize like how, I guess, bad folks are with money, you know? Here's, I think, where that comes from, though, is that in most instances in life, there's a strong correlation between effort and results. Like in most things in life, if you try harder, you're going to do better. I was using the example of like, there's stories of Tiger Woods when he was young, he'd go to the range and hit a thousand golf balls and just working, you know, working at a swing 12 hours a day. Um, the story from Bill Gates, where he went 20 years, he said, without taking a day off, he worked seven days a week for 20 years. And most of those days he would like work till midnight, come home and collapse on his couch and do it again the next day, seven days a week for 20 years. And he, by doing that, he built Microsoft. So we intuitively know that in most things, if you try harder, you'll do better. And I just think that, um, Investing is not one of those fields, but it's not intuitive. The intuition is if you try harder, you will do better. And for a very small number of people, that's the case. But for most people, it's the other way around. The harder you try, the worse you're going to do. Like all the studies that show for retail investors, especially, the more you trade, the worse you're going to do. Really clear correlation between that. Um, but I just think it's not intuitive for people to, if you tell them, hey, if you just leave it alone and do nothing and go enjoy your life, do something else, find a hobby, hang out with your family, you will do much better. And most people hear that and they're like, they either don't believe you or they believe you, but they're like, yeah, but what if I, what if I use this trading strategy? What if I was like, I, what if I have a strategy that I'm going to sell when this happens and buy when this happens? Yeah. And they do it with good, good intentions. They're the, it's the equivalent of telling people like, like what, what those people think they're doing is like, oh, if I go to the gym more often, I'll be healthier, which is true for the gym. But that equivalent for investing is not the case. It's the opposite. And, but it's so counterintuitive. That's why people do these. And, and I think it's often framed when you point out how bad investors some people are. It's meant to point out that like they're not very smart or that they're irrational or that they're kind of like crazy risk takers. I think it's not the case. Most people are really smart, genuine people who are just falling for this counterintuition of the lack of correlation between effort and results in investing that is unique to almost any other aspect of their life. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, it just made me think of like a few follow-ons to that too. Like, like they just can't leave it alone. Like I don't, that's where it's like, is it because they can't, they feel like they don't have enough or they want more, or they get greedy or they think like they can outsmart 
the market, like when they start to tinker with too many things or maybe, I don't, maybe, maybe even like use leverage and things like that, it's just kind of baffling to me that the, it's just the simple strategies can do so much better. I think there's a couple aspects to it. One is that there's not many areas in life where a complete amateur with no experience has at least the possibility of doing very well. Now you can have someone who has no idea what they're doing, who opens up a Robinhood account and earns a thousand percent return. It's not likely, but it's possible. But in other areas of life, it would be completely impossible. If someone was like, I'm going to start doing open heart surgery on my neighbors in my garage. It's like, okay, you have no chance of success doing that. Unless you, like you have the odds of success are 0.0%. Or if someone like an ordinary person was like, I'm going to build a hundred story skyscraper. The odds of success are 0%. You need a certain level of education and tools and capital to get, to have any shot of doing it well, but investing, you don't, it's possible to do well by chance. And so it lures in a lot of people who, because of beginner's luck, or because they saw a friend or a neighbor or a cousin who got really rich off of luck. When they see that they're like, well, if he could do it, I could do it too. That's part of it. The other part of it is that it's such a, like a 24 seven um, media kind of circus that's formed around it of, you know, whether it's CNBC or Twitter or blogs, or like you log onto your brokerage account and it's like literally flashing green and red lights. There's such an aspect of catching your attention in ways that other things in life don't, you know, people really have very little idea about the metrics of their own physical health. Like, what is your blood pressure? What is your, like, what is your, you know, your, your blood test levels? People have no clue what those numbers are, but a lot of these amateur investors can tell you with a lot of precision, like how much is, is Amazon stock selling right for right now? And they can tell you down to the penny. But if I said, what is your blood pressure? They have no clue. So a lot of it is just like the amount of data and how the data is presented just gets people attached to the stock market in ways that things that are more important to their well-being, they're completely clueless about. See that that right there, like again, it's one of those things like Morgan that I love about I love about you and the way you think is like it's in like plain view. But when you describe it that's that way, it's like, yeah, that's actually really interesting. We don't know our actual like the metrics that matter, yet we can like say exactly like what a certain stock did um in a single day, like as you mentioned, like down to the penny. Um I do want to bring up something else in the book that's interesting, um, and we can start to unpack that a bit too, is Warren Buffett. You and I, we both follow Buffett. We follow Charlie Munger. But it was so interesting because, you know, if you're asked, right, who's the greatest investor of all time? Like pretty much anyone on the street who follows this would probably say Warren Buffett, yet you point out it's Jim Simons of Renaissance Technologies. Like let's unpack that right there, the, the contrast that you draw between the two investors, um, that, I thought that was so interesting. Well, if you asked who is the ri richest investor of all time, it's Buffett. And that's why he's well known. He was, he's one of the richest men in the world. He's a household name virtually because of how rich he is. He's worth over a hundred billion dollars, but he's not the best investor because there are other people who have earned much higher annual returns than Buffett has. Buffett's annual returns throughout the course of his career are something like 22% annually. It's in, in, in that range, something like that. But there are hedge fund managers like Jim Simons, whose average annual returns are over 60% per year, three times as good as Buffett, like three times as successful as Buffett. The reason that Jim Simons is less wealthy than Buffett, which is a crazy thing to say, because Jim Simons is worth like $30 billion or something, is because he's been doing it for a shorter period of time. Warren Buffett started investing full-time when he was like 11 years old. And today he's 92 and he's still going full-time. And that fact alone of how long he's been doing it for, that's literally 99% of his success. Because you can do the math and say, if Warren Buffett started investing at age 30, like a normal person might, and if he retired at age 65, like a normal person might, and he still earned his 22% returns per year, in that hypothetical world, what would he be worth today? And the answer is literally like 99.9% .9 less than he is. All of his success is tied to the fact that he started when he was 11 and he kept going through all the way through today when he's 92. And that's what does it. That's what everything. So is Buffett a, a good investor? Yes, of course he is. He's a great investor. But the whole secret is that he's been a great investor for 80 years. That's everything. And Jim Simons has been a successful investor for, I think, like 25 years. Now, his annual returns are so ridiculously good, but he's still less wealthy than Buffett because it's a much shorter period of time that he's been doing it for. I think the takeaway for ordinary people like, like us is it's not necessarily, the question that most investors ask is how can I earn the highest returns? 
That's the intuitive question that they want to answer. And I think a much more important question to answer though is what are the best returns that I can earn for the longest period of time? And for most of people, for most people, this is how I invest. What I want to do is earn average returns for an above average period of time. And if you can do that, you will end up with way above average results. It's not intuitive to think that if you earn average returns, you can earn, you can end up in the top 5% of investors, but if you can do it for an above average period of time, you will. Howard Marks told the story about an investor that he knew who in any given year, he was never in the top half of professional investors. So he's a hedge fund manager in any given year. He never tops, he never cracks the top 50%, but over the course of his career, he ended up in the top 10% of all investors, the top 10% of all hedge fund managers, just because he stayed in the game and was able to do it for 25 years or something like that. So I think that's, that's what I aspire to as an investor. I'm a pretty passive investor. And it's not because like I, I, I want to do poorly over time. It's, it's not because I want to do less well than the active investors. It's because like in any given year, so many investors will earn higher returns than I will. But I'm pretty confident that if you look over a lifetime, if you look over 50 years of investing, I'm pretty confident that I will end up in the top, maybe like 5% of investors, just because I hope to be doing it for a longer period of time than they will. I was so going to ask you that. Because I, like, I get the sense that you were like tap dance to work. Like you love what you do. And I was like, oh man, like how long are you going to go for this? Because it is interesting. Like if Buffett threw in the town, retired like every person in, in his sixties, like we wouldn't even be talking about him, you know, like how long, like, I, I would just love to like explore that with you. Like how how long do you want to do this? Or you just mentioned it, but like, like why, like why keep going or, or not just like retire? I think if you, yeah, that's a good, it's a good question. I think if you view it as like, I'm investing so that I can grow my net worth to be X dollars. And then I'm going to cash out X dollars and buy a boat and buy a big house. If you view it like that of like, it's a really clear, I'm doing X so that I can gain Y then it's, 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 it's more of a short-term game. It's not a bad game. I admire that game. But if you view it as just like, I enjoy this process, and I think there's a good chance that my, I and my wife will die when our net worth is near the highest it's ever been. A lot of people would look at that and say, I, 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 I don't want that. I don't admire that. I don't understand that. And that, that, that's fine. It totally works well for me because... I would, I think on my deathbed, if I look back, kind of, kind of grim that we're talking about this, but let's, let's run with well, it. We're all going to go I, I think it, someday. So we're, we're all going to die someday. And we're not getting out of here alive. Said, so if I look back and said, my net worth is the highest it's ever been on the day that I die, but I'm going to leave a lot of it to charity and a lot of it to my kids. I would be like, perfect. Love it. Great. No problem. There's a book that I have down here. Somebody sent me. It's like, it's called um, die with zero. And I think the, I think the point of, I haven't read it yet, but I think the point is, you know, it's like the joke, like the, 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 the check you write to the funeral house should bounce. That's when, you know, you've, you've lived a good life. Like your last check bounces. I understand that point of view too. I don't disagree with it, but I, I think there's part of that view that inherently says like, I want to become rich so that I can buy more stuff. That's kind of what it, it says to some degree. And my goals are not that like, I want to have wealth so that I can be independent. And so I can have a level, you know, pass some on to my kids so that they can have some level of stability in their life. Not too much, but some, some level. So I can use anything that I've gained to kind of benefit the community that that's most appealing to me. And I think we live a, a pretty, a, 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 a decent life, but I don't view of like getting richer so that I can buy a bigger house. It's never really been about that. It's more just how can I have independence? And since I want independence, like I want that on the day I die. When the day that I die, I want to be independent too. And inherent in that means like, I want to have a pretty high net worth on the day that I die. And I'm totally fine with that. Um, whereas some other people would disagree with that, but that gets down to, there's a lot of different ways to manage money. You just have to figure out what fits your own personality. So the yeah. person who wrote the book, Die Was Zero, He's a hedge fund manager. I, I probably, I probably don't agree with it. And he probably doesn't agree with me. And I think that's fine. I think it's, there's no, there's no issue with that. Everyone's just got to figure out what, what works for them. Yeah. Um, it, that, that is true. It's like, what works for you? And like, I, one of the things I, I just appreciated was like saying like a key use of wealth is using it to control your time and it provides you with options. And so like some of those options, like you said, like with your family and, and whatnot, um, you did like mention like a letter you wrote to your son. Um, would love to like revisit that and like 
how do you talk to your children about um, money? I guess some of the, you know, more behavioral issues surrounding money. I don't know how old your kids are, but, or maybe like what kind of conversation would you have with them when they are a little bit older? Um, Cause I feel like we yeah. don't talk about money with kids, you know, sometimes it feels like maybe a little taboo or something. But. Totally. So our kids are three and six We have a three-year-old daughter and a six-year-old son. The letter to my son, I wrote a similar one to my daughter, but I wrote that to our son, who was our firstborn before he was born, obviously. And I think like, like, any other parent back there, you have these parenting ideals of how you're going to parent your kids before you become parents. And then once you're in the trenches, so to speak, once you're actually a, a live parent, it's like, oh, it's totally different. It's like throw out the plan, throw out the ideals, like here's reality. And so I, I, don't, I don't regret that letter. I don't think there's anything in the letter that I necessarily disagree with. But what I've learned since becoming a parent is that, so our son and daughter are com completely different people. They have the same, the same genetics, the same parents, the same house, the same like morals and philosophies in their household. They're totally different people, Com night and day, their personalities. And of course, I think that's true for my siblings. I'm the youngest of three and my brother, sister, and I are totally different people, complete, completely different people. And so when you accept that reality that like even people in the same household grow up to be very different, you can't assume that there are things that I can teach my kids about money that they will admire or benefit from, or that will fit their life. Because I have no clue who, what my kids are going to grow up to be or aspire to be. I have no clue where my wife and I are going to be in 10 or 20 years either. So it's, I, I become a little bit more humble about this of like, what do you teach your kids? Because I have no idea who my kids are going to be when they are old enough to be earning their own money. And it's also, I know that there is such a natural rebellion, particularly among teenagers, a natural tendency, I would say among teenagers to rebel against their parents. So if, I think a lot of parents get this wrong. It's like your kids turn 15 or 16 and their parents are like, okay, I'm going to teach you about money. Let's sit down and I'm going to lecture you about the right things to do with their money. I think most of the time, not only does that not work, it backfires. Most 16 year olds will listen to that and be like, great, I'm going to do the exact opposite just to show you that I'm my own individual person and I'm not just a parrot of my parents. And so I never want to be the lecturer in teaching my kids about money. I think if we can lead by example, or not even, I think lead by example gets kind of misconstrued because, so the example I give is my parents have been vegetarians for 45 years. And so my, my, whole, my whole life and my siblings' life, my parents have been vegetarians. And when we were young kids growing up, we ate vegetarian because that's what my parents made. That's how they cooked. But by the time that we were like 10 years old, my parents said, hey, they sat us down and said, this is how we eat. Here's why we eat this way. If you want to do it differently, if you want to go eat meat, totally up to you. We support that. We will help you. We will buy you the meat too, even if we don't eat it. And they let us do it on our own. And Did you eat I the think meat? that, uh, yeah, all, all, all three of us do. Not, not very much. I think when you grow up vegetarian, it's hard to go onto a, the full meat eating diet. So I, I do, but not, 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 not that much. Um, but I think that the template of that is like, I think that's a good way to parent being like, here's what we do. Here's why we do it within reason. If you want to do something differently, please do. Let me show you the, the consequences and the boundaries of what I think you should do with other decisions. But I think that's, that's a much better way to parent rather than lecturing and saying, this is the right way to do it. And if you do it any other way, you're doing it wrong. I think with diet and money and a bunch of other things, religion, probably that's, that's, that's a bunch better template for how to parent. Yeah. We just mentioned your own parents. Um, give us a bit more of a sense of like growing up, what that was like for you. I think the thing that was a little bit unique is that, um, my, my dad started his undergraduate college when he was 30 and had three kids. I'm the youngest of three. He started, call, he started undergraduate like the month after I was born. And he became a doctor when we were all teenagers. So all of our early years, myself and my, my two siblings, we were very, very poor. My, my parents were in school, um, just living off of like whatever they could scrape together from student loans and grants and whatnot. We were living in student housing for almost my entire childhood. And as a child, we thought it was great because we didn't know any better. And we were living with other people who were in that same situation. So it was a great childhood. Everything was great. And then when we became a teenager, my dad became a doctor and things changed after that. And what was really interesting is that even as my dad went from a student to a doctor overnight, the frugality that was enforced upon them when they were broke stuck around. So even though their income went up exponentially, spending honestly didn't change that much. Changed a little bit, but not that much. So we had a very, still pretty frugal upbringing. And we lived in a, a modest house and drove a modest car and went on like really modest vacations. And that was an important part of the upbringing because when I was a teenager, especially, 
I look down upon that decision that my parents made to be that frugal. Cause I would always say when I was 15, 16, I would be like, I know how much money you make. And I know you, we could be driving a nicer car. I know we could live in a nicer house and we don't. And I'm mad at you for it. <laughs> like I, 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 I'd look down upon you for doing that. And then, so my dad was an ER doctor, worked in the, worked, worked, worked in the, in the ER for his whole career, which I think is one of the most stressful careers you can have because it's literally people dying in front of you. That's the job is taking care of people who are about to die or are dying or did die. Very stressful job. So after 20 years of doing that, he said, I'm done. I've, I've, he was kind of burnt out from it. He said, I'm done. I'm going to, I'm going to retire. And he was able to just walk away at kind of a moment's notice because he had been so frugal throughout his whole career. He was, he had such a high savings rate that the day he decided he was done, he just, he was done. He retired. And that on that moment, which was not that long ago, this is five or 10 years ago. I was like, Oh, now I get it. The reason you are so cheap the reason we didn't drive the Porsche, the reason we didn't live in the big house is because you wanted to have save up enough money so that you could have control and independence over, every, over your life. And the moment you didn't want to work anymore, you just stopped working. And that gave them so much more pleasure and happiness and contentment in life than the Porsche ever would have times a hundred. Yeah. And so that was a big, like stark moment in thinking about money when I saw my parents do that. And I was like, Oh, now I get it. I think the purpose of money and how you can use it to better your life is to use it to gain control over your time and to give yourself independence and autonomy and to do what you want, when you want, for as long as you want to, or as long as you don't want to. And if you can use your money to do that, then by all means, like strive for that more than you strive for the big house. I think that was the takeaway for me because that was the, that was what I saw growing up now. Inherent in that is like everyone sees something different going up. That was my story. You've got your own story. Everyone's got their stories of what they saw that has a huge impact. Well, it's funny. You know, it my, my dad them. used to point out like, you know, just because someone had a nice car didn't mean like they had a, they were wealthy or had a lot of money. It could just be like they spent all that money. And I think it, it's important because you point out in the book, like there's a difference between being rich and having wealth or being wealthy. Like, yeah, that's a really so important I, distinction. And I, I, I make up that definition when I say this. I'm just, I just kind of made this up myself. But I view rich as like you have enough income to make your monthly payments. And you can actually make them. You can make your car payment and your house payment. And you can actually, quote unquote, afford these things that you have. Wealth is almost the opposite. Wealth is the money that you don't spend. It's the money that you're not spending on your car payments. The money that you're not spending on your house. It's money that you save up and are not spending. It's just wealth accumulating to you. That's what wealth is. And it's when wealth is the money that you don't spend by its nature, it's money that you don't see. Cause I can see the car you drive and I can see the house that you live in, but I cannot see your bank account and I can't see your brokerage account. I have no idea what your net worth is. It's true for everybody. And just because somebody is driving the fancy car or driving the Honda civic, you have no clue what their net worth is. And this was another valet realization when some of these people that were driving six figure cars, I would get to know them, become kind of chit chatty with them. And I would learn that they were actually not that successful. They were like mediocre career successes and they spent half their money on a Porsche payment. They spent half their income on a Porsche payment. That was like a big number of these people. And so that was another realization of like, just because you appear to be wealthy, I have no clue what's going on behind the scenes. And so that was, that was a big realization um, as well. And, and that kind of person, Ha probably has very little control over their life, little control over their schedule. They have to keep working to keep up this grind that they have, to keep up this lifestyle um, expectation that they have versus the people like my dad who did not have the flash, but they had complete control over their time, total 100% autonomy over what they wanted to do. And at least from my perspective, I was like, I would much rather have that. And I think that leads to more happiness than the person who is stretching themselves to the limits. Yeah. And then on the other side, there's like the Ronald Reeds of the world that you didn't know that he was a multimillionaire until he passed. And it's like, well, like, why not live a little and use some of the wealth you had attained over that time? See, this is a, a, a um, something I regret about the book is that I think I kind of framed Ronald Reed as a hero as like, oh, shouldn't you want to be him too? Shouldn't you want to live in a shack and wear torn jeans and like live in, a, in an abject sense of poverty and then die with a zillion dollars in the bank, what a hero. It's kind of like, no, I think like he is the extreme example. And I wanted to use him as an example of, you don't need a lot of education to gain wealth. You just need the right mentality. But I don't aspire to live like that. I wanna live a better material life than he did. Like there's limitations to what I wanna spend, but more than he did, he was such an extreme outlier. 
So I, I, I sort of regret about that, that, uh, that I, I, I framed him as a hero when I was just trying to use him as an extreme example. Yeah, there's a way, to, certainly a way to find balance, it seems. Um, I want to kind of bring this conversation around to just like some of the more current things, like kind of using this framework, like, I guess there are different like biases. I don't know if you'd call them like by like rules or, but just kind of observations and biases. You kind of put together all of these different ones um, in the book. I, maybe just kind of looking at things like right now, I'll just bring up like some current things like inflation. It feels like everybody's talking about inflation or then you had like the recent sell-off, um, especially in like tech stocks. Like how do you apply some of these frameworks to some of like the current happenings in the market? And maybe even maybe for like the younger generation too, because you kind of point to like different generations have different perspectives. We probably have younger a younger audience listening. So maybe let's tie it back to more like millennials, Gen Z, that sort of thing. I think what's interesting about the younger investors is that so many of these investors started investing in like mid 2020. A lot of that was just like, they were on COVID lockdown. They can't go to the movies with their friends. They can't go to sporting events. They're not going to school. What are you going to do to keep yourself entertained? You're going to open up a Robinhood account and start day trading. And Hey, that's amazing to do because the market was going straight up. It was going vertical during those, that period. So you made a ton of money doing it and all the big names, the meme stocks, you're doubling your money every couple of months everyone is stoked. And that's not a couple of people. That's literally tens of millions of people. If you look at the new accounts opened at Robinhood and E-Trade and all these brokerages, tens of millions of them started investing in mid 2020. And in their view, what the stock market is, is something that goes up every week, every month. And if you're not doubling your money every year, you're doing something wrong. I had someone tell me on Twitter about a year ago, they said, if you can't double your money in the stock market every year, you have no idea what you're doing. And I remember being like, oh, okay, that's, that's, that's <laughs> like a view of like, that's where expectations are. But when that's all you've ever known, I could understand why you would think that. You've never experienced anything else. And maybe you can read about 2008, you can read about um, the dot-com crash, but that's, that's like ancient history in your view. And nothing is more persuasive than what you've experienced firsthand. So what they've experienced firsthand was tech stocks double every couple of months. I'm really good at it. You can make a ton of money doing this. And you dinosaurs that are talking about two, the dot-com crash, like what that's like, that's, that's for these old people who have no idea what they're doing. And so a lot of those investors who had that mentality that peaked about a year ago, the last six months have been complete and utter shell shock for them. And I think every generation goes through this for my, for our generation, it was the dot-com bust of like, for a lot of us, that was the first time that we were like, Oh, not only can the market go down, it can go down 90%. For, for tech stocks. And we had, we had really had no clue. So I think for a lot of investors, the feeling of the last six months is a sense that you were cheated, a sense that something was taken away from you, a sense that you got bamboozled, bamboozled, a sense of shame. Even if what has happened in the last six, six months is completely normal. And if you look at the history of the stock market, like the S&P 500 is down 20%, something like that. Maybe it's 23%. If you look at the long history of the stock market, that happens on average every three or four years. Like what we've, what we've experienced in the, last, in the last six months is totally normal, completely par for the course, what you should expect to happen on a fairly regular basis. But if you're new to investing, it feels like a once in a century flood because that's all, it's the first time you've ever experienced it. So I think that's, that's a big part of what's going on right now is you were experiencing something that's very normal and completely inevitable, but it feels like a 9-11 style event to people who have never known anything else but a bull market. How about um the how about cryptocurrency? How about Bitcoin? Do you have any thoughts there? I I've never owned any any crypto. I maybe I will in the future, but I, I, it wouldn't surprise me if I never do. I think um, look, I, I'm not saying anything that's I think that other people haven't said a million times, but crypto is driven by sentiment. That like there there, there might be people who would push back against that, but that's what that's what I'm going to run with, and sentiment. The boundaries of sentiment in either direction can be so crazy. It could be crazy high. It could be crazy low. A lot of that is just because how fast stories travel on social media and what is persuasive. And whenever you have an asset class that is so driven by sentiment and a social media where the most appealing sentiment rises to the top, like the, 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 the storytellers that tell the best story get all the attention. And when people can tell a crazy story, that gains so much attention, the boundaries in either direction can be really extreme. If I had to guess what the future of, of Bitcoin is going to be, let's not talk about like 
Web3 use cases of just like a Bitcoin as an asset class, I would expect it to have huge boom and bust cycles, which by the way is what gold has done as well. Like gold over a very long period of time hasn't gone really anywhere adjusted for inflation, but it has massive, massive booms and busts. If, 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 if I viewed Bitcoin as being that in the future, I think that's probably the most likely scenario. There's so many other details to get into in terms of like what regulation could do, what further adoption could do. Like there's all these different details, but I think as a baseline assumption, that's what I think of it. So what's happened to it, not just in the last six months, but the last 10 years of crazy booms and busts, like this is like the fourth time or something that Bitcoin has fallen 60 plus percent. This is nothing new. I think that's as a baseline assumption, it'll probably keep doing that in the future just because it is driven by sentiment and not much else. Interesting. So you've never even dabbled, just curious, like not even like- No, a never. And like maybe maybe I, I, I should, I should. Um, I think one thing that I, it's true about how my wife and I manage money is I think we have very little FOMO. We have very little like, oh, this has gone up so much and it might keep going up. So then therefore we should buy it. It doesn't, it really doesn't really have any impact on us. It's more just like, hey, we have index funds that earn an average return and a lot of cash that gives us flexibility and independence and autonomy. And that's good enough. That checks every box that we want. I, I think over the long term, that's a pretty healthy attitude to have, but it makes it so that you go through these periods when you look like a fool because other people are earning way higher returns than you. And they're like, don't you want into the club? Don't you want to do this too? And the truth is like, not, not really. We're, we're pretty happy just doing our, I our think boring people thing. would be pretty happy though if they were in your position though, just to have some cash put to work or it, all, it, it always, it always makes sense after yeah. the fact, but if you or I were having this conversation a year ago, I looked like, I looked just like an out of touch grandpa. But isn't that kind of funny too? It's like in the aftermath, you kind of were like, yeah, it makes sense. And like one of the things too, in the book, we need to bring this up. is just the way you kind of like piece things together, tail events and like, you tied one, you tied the student loan crisis to nine 11, which is like, oh, I never thought of that. Like walk us through that and like how you think about tail events because we do kind of people do look back at like history you know it's always hard to say like because of because of because this event happened then this event happened but i think you can kind of tie together little narratives that are incomplete but they're narratives that you can really string together like how we got to now one of those narratives and i'm i'm being i'm really cherry picking like this specific thing but if you think okay after 9 11 the fed was really scary that we were going to fall into a deep depression so it slashed interest rates after it slashed interest rates, it sparked a housing bubble in the early 2000s. Then we had a housing bubble that collapsed in 2007. After that housing bubble collapsed, the economy was really weak in the early 2010s. When it was really weak, the, the job prospects for people graduating college were very bad. When the job prospects were bad, people wanted to stay in college. They either wanted to go to college or stay around to get a graduate degree because they couldn't get a job anywhere. So the number of people who like, went to law school or got an MBA or got a bachelor's degree because they couldn't find a job because the economy was so weak was huge. And that was a, at least one driver, at least to a small degree of the student loan bubble, the student loan surge. So therefore like you can tie 9-11 to the rise in student debt. It's like interest rates fell, started, sparked a housing bubble, housing bubble collapsed, economy was weak. So because the economy was weak, people wanted to go to college. That's like, it's normally you would never associate okay, these terrorists hijacked these planes. And then 15 years later, we had $2 trillion of student debt. That doesn't make a lot of sense. But I think if you, with a little bit of imagination, you can tie together like a million of those events of like, what's going on in the, in the world today? Why is inflation high? Why is the national debt where it is? Why is the stock market where it is? If you keep just like pulling the thread of what happened, it starts to make a lot more sense. And you realize that you can tie that thread, you can keep going back forever. Like, um, you know, why is, why is inflation where it is today? Well, you know, the Fed was, was printing a lot of money. Why did it print a lot of money? Well, it was really scared of deflation in 2008. Why was it scared of deflation? Well, there's other, been other episodes, particularly the Great Depression, where like deflation was really, was really terrible. You can keep tying back why what's going on today to something that happened in the past. And I think it's really helpful to know that like, we always view these things in a vacuum of inflation is high today because the Fed screwed up yesterday. Well, like that, that narrative might be true, but why did the Fed screw up yesterday? Well, he was thinking about this other event, which tied to this other event. And that's where I think a lot of economic history can be really helpful of just like realizing where we are, the deep roots of where we are, are really, really deep. And, but in the press and when we're thinking about these, we tend to think about them in a vacuum when they're actually 
really complex events. I like that. And the yeah. other the other takeaway from that is that when there's a big event like 9/11 or the Great Depression or World War II or COVID, you have no clue what the echo ramifications are going to be from that. Because on the day after 9/11, nobody said. No one went on TV, on TV and said, this is going to start a student debt boom. Nobody said that. You would have been a fool to say that, but it's what happened. And no one knows. And nobody knows. And whenever there's a big upheaval, the, the echoes, the ripples from that get more extreme. And COVID is obviously a massive, massive you know, event, just like threw a boulder in the, in the water. And we have no idea where the ripples from that are really going to end. Yeah. Um, before I let you go, let's just kind of do like um, a bit of a rapid fire here. What do you think is the worst investment decision you've ever made? Can I say not investing in Bitcoin? But I don't regret it. But that's probably that's probably one of them. If you just want to take it like percentage terms, okay. that's probably it. Um, what What's the best investment decision you've ever made? Uh, I think it's uh, making sure that my expectations don't exceed my income. I know that's kind of a quirky. I, I know the answer you want is like what ticker, but I think I think it's that. I think it's making sure that my expectations stay below my income growth. Um. This isn't really like a rapid fire, but I do want to bring it up because you mentioned um, your wife and you and I've talked about our spouses. Um, you know, Warren Buffett always says like that's the most important decision you make in, in, in your life is like who you choose to be your life partner. Um, yeah, like talk to us a bit about like how your wife has like made you a better person, better investor, because you've mentioned her a few times. So I would just love to hear from you. I think um, if she were if she were on right now, she would say. I can be, I myself can be very patient with investments. And when it comes to investing, I have all the patience in the world. I'm thinking about the next 50 years, but in other areas in life, I have a, a pretty short attention span and a short level of patience. Um, and I think that's where she's kind of grounded me the most. Like she, the, I, here's how I explain her personality. The gap between my worst moods and best moods is a mile wide. The gap between her worst mood and best mood is like an inch. It's like she is the most emotionally stable person that I think I've ever met. She's not abnormally happy. She's not abnormally depressed. She's just like totally stable all the time. And she can compartmentalize bad events better than anyone I've ever seen. And so I think when you pair that with my, I can like, I can swing from one extreme to the next pretty well. It's been, that's been what's most helpful for me. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that. Um, how about your daily routine? We often talk about routines like what time to get up. What do you do? Like what is kind of your ritual on a daily basis? I've worked from home my entire career for I don't know, 13, 14 years. I've always worked from home. And so, you know, most people have, or a lot of people have for the last two years, but for me, it's been, this is what it's always, it's always been. And that's really been helpful because I think what a lot of people notice about working from home is now that your coworkers and your boss is not, are not watching you they're, They don't have their eyeballs on you. You can kind of do what is most efficient rather than what looks the best. What looks the best is sitting at your desk typing or being in a meeting talking, looking productive. But a lot of times when you're at home and no one's watching you, what's most productive for you to do is to sit on the couch in your sweatpants and think about what's going on in your job. Like most people who are listening to this probably have thought jobs. Their job is to make a good decision. And a lot of times the best the best way that you can make a good decision is by doing something that does not look like work. It's so going for a walk, going for a bike ride, sitting on the couch, whatever it might be, where you're like, that's when creativity flows and that's when you can really think a problem through. So a huge part of my day, and it's always been like this, is just kind of like sitting around, reading, um, talking to friends. And it doesn't look like work and it doesn't feel like work, but it helps me kind of think these problems through, thinking of the next article idea, thinking of a book idea. That's really when it comes. Like it doesn't, it doesn't feel like work or look like work, but if your job is to come up with a new idea, uh, to try to come up with an insight about what's going on in the world, I think that's what's, that's what's been most helpful. So most, most of my day, it's totally unstructured, not much on the calendar. It's just a lot of casual reading and going for walks and talking to people, trying to come up with some, some observation, some story that I can write about. Yeah, I heard that you like to go on walks. I'm glad you mentioned that um, as part of your process. Um, all right, so final question. Uh, Morgan, if you were not writing, um, what would you do for a living? I would, oh, easy. I would want to go back to being a valet and I'm dead serious. About really? that. It was such a fun job. It was such a cool job for three reasons. Drive amazing cars, work outside running around and have an insight into a, a sliver of society that is fascinating to watch. High egos, high income, high social aspirations to just to observe that little sliver of society was so fascinating to watch. They were drunk a lot of the time. They were trying to impress each other. It was so, it was such as like a window into a, a, 
part of society that I, I, I miss doing it and I wish I could go back sometimes. That's fascinating. Like just the way it changes your perspective on things. Maybe it's like one of those things more people should do, you know? I think, I think, I think being a waiter is probably really similar of just like you, you, you get to have a conversation with people that you would never otherwise would. And you see a side of them that is a really like showboaty oh, aspect of their were life. You a, were you a waiter as well? No, no, oh, no. just a, just, just a valet. Just a valet. Well, it's a fascinating discussion. Um, Everyone go pick up the book, Psychology of Money, Timeless Lessons on Wealth, Greed, and Happiness by Morgan Housel. And I got to say, these really are timeless lessons. So um, Morgan, thanks so much for the great conversation and um, look forward to talking to you again soon.